welcome students to this uh, new class of uh, international tribunal for the law of the sea uh, i hope all of you are well and keeping yourself safe that uh, international tribunal for the sea uh, is a very important tribunal and uh, this tribunal is uh, set up by the the uh, united nations convention on the law of the sea 1982 and this un convention on the law of the sea i have told you that was implemented in the year uh, 1994 although this statute the legal basis uh, was agreed by the international community way back in 1982 but uh, it was to be implemented only in 1994 so uh, you have to look at the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea also. And if you look at the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, in Article 287, uh, it says that uh, the states which have signed this convention, they are free to choose by means of a declaration for the settlement of disputes concerning the interpretation or application of this convention. It means that uh, those states which have, which have signed this convention, uh, they have the choice to uh, get any kind of different forum which are given in Article 287. What are the different fora which are there? First is International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. This is one of the tribunal which is established uh, according to this provision of these provisions of UN convention the second choice of forum is icj international court of justice so a party may also uh, have the choice the party has a choice to go to uh, icj the next uh, choice is arbitral tribunal so uh, arbitral tribunal the oldest arbitral tribunal in the world is permanent court of arbitration which was established in the year 1800 by uh, the 1899 convention. So uh, the parties have the choice to go there. And then lastly, a special arbitral tribunal, which can be constituted uh, in accordance with Annex 8 uh, for one or more of the categories of disputes there. So students, what I'm telling you that the countries which have signed this UN convention, they have the freedom to uh, take recourse to any of these different fora. And the first fora which is given uh, in the UN convention is International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And this International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which is called ITLOS in short, uh, this ITLOS is now functioning very well. And uh, if you look at uh, this statute of it laws, because uh, the it laws is working on the basis of its own statute. So uh, you see that uh, this, is, this is the UN convention I told you. So this is the UN convention and then uh, UN convention, the law of the sea. And then uh, this is uh, the the statute of international tribunal for the law of the sea you see this is the statute of international tribunal for the law of the sea now this statute is a is the basis of the working of this tribunal uh, like you might have heard that uh, the icj statute is the basis of the working of international court of justice i have uh, discussed with you several times article 38 of the statute of international court of justice which deals with uh, different sources of international law so uh, international court of justice works on the basis of its own statute likewise international tribunal for the law of the sea that also works on the basis of its own statute i told you that this is the statute of Interna uh, international tribunal for the law of the sea it laws and uh, according to this uh, tribunal this is statute of the tribunal we will uh, try to understand some of its uh, 
salient provisions uh, which will uh, make you understand that how this tribunal is working. Now, according to Article 2 of this statute, uh, how many judges are there? Article 2 says that it will be having 21 judges. And how will those people, those judges be elected? They will be elected on the basis of some of their own merits. And their own merit is that they are very fair and they have a reputation for fairness. They have the reputation for integrity and not only any kind of reputation, but highest reputation. And secondly, that they must be having a recognized competence in the field of the law of the sea. So these are the two important personal uh, merits which are needed. And thereafter, uh, to make the system, whole system as a fair system, uh, it further says in paragraph two that uh, the judges would be selected on the basis of the principal legal system which they represent. And it will be also selected on the basis of equitable geographical distribution. So these are some of the basic considerations which are taken into account while uh, selecting the judges of uh, this tribunal. However, there are 21 judges of this tribunal. Now, how much term they enjoy? Uh, they enjoy a term of nine years. So it is very uh, similar to the ICJ judges, the judges of the International Court of, Judge, International Court of Justice they, they also have the nine years term. Likewise, the judges of International Tribunal of the Sea, Law of the Sea, they have also nine years term. Apart from these judges, which enjoy tenure, like nine years tenure, apart from that, uh, there are some judges who can be appointed on ad hoc basis. And there would be also the possibility of appointment of some scientific uh, experts, technical experts, and those people, they can be appointed because uh, C matters cannot be resolved unless you know proper coordinates of many places and you do not know the tidal waves and the different uh, ways in which the tidal waves and its uh, uh, locations and uh, the magnitude and the pressure and uh, the, the, the whole direction of uh, uh, making the base points, etc. So these things require scientific expertise. And because judges are not the scientists themselves, therefore what happens that uh, there is a provision of appointment of the experts. So those experts can be from scientific uh, fields as well as technical fields. Now you will be happy to know that uh, currently uh, there is one judge from India and sometimes we ask this question uh, objective in objective type uh, in some examinations like entrance or in some competitive examination that uh, currently is there any representation from india to this tribunal the answer is yes miss neeru chadha is there and uh, you see this uh, uh, picture uh, so uh, she this lady is uh, neeru chadha and she had come to our faculty and uh, uh, she had uh, come to uh, inaugurate this function uh, which was for the faculty development program and uh, i was uh, very much privileged to share the dais with her so neeru shaddha is there uh, in the international tribunal for the law of the sea the next thing that you should uh, know uh, that this tribunal is based in hamburg in germany so uh, I told you some, uh, somehow uh, in the earlier uh, days that uh, Germany, when uh, North Sea Continental Shelf case was uh, being argued uh, in ICJ, uh, then uh, Germany's uh, prowess in uh, the law of the sea matters that came to be known by the international community. And uh, Germany took uh, interest in uh, this field because Germany had won in that uh, case. Uh, so that is one of the reasons why uh, this uh, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea that was uh, located in Hamburg. 
So uh, you can also go there and uh, look at the functioning of International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. The next thing that I will uh, like to make you uh, know that uh, what are the different uh, uh, kind of entities which have the access to uh, this International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Now, as far as Article 20, uh, 2 -0, Law Center 2, so Article 20, Article 2, 2 was on uh, the, the, the number of judges and Article 20, 20 is on that what are the entities which have the access to uh, this tribunal. So if you compare the accessibility of these entities uh, uh, with International Court of Justice, ICJ is accessible only to countries which are party to the UN Charter. Uh, but this UN uh, Tribunal, International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, that is not only accessible to states, parties to UN Convention on Law of the Sea, but it is also accessible to entities which are other than the state parties, uh, but in accordance with Part 11 uh, concerning seabed. Uh, uh, seabed, seabed area. So part 11 of the UN Convention that is uh, relating to international seabed area. So in that uh, international seabed area, uh, if uh, uh, other than states parties are working, then in that case, those entities, they have the access to international tribunal for the law of the sea. Then state enterprises. So as you know that states uh, are running enterprises also. So those state enterprises, for example, like India, uh, India has many enterprises which are owned by state or majority stake uh, is held by the uh, by by our own country. So likewise, now uh, those entities uh, are suppose suppose ONGC is exploring in the international seabed area and uh, exploiting, and then it has certain case, so a certain dispute, and then uh, that may be also so ONGC may also so state enterprises can also be going to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And also natural person. So uh, now when, if you remember uh, what we were discussing when we had started that who are the subjects of international law. Then I told you that in the modern times, uh, not only countries, but also international organizations, as well as uh, individuals, they have also become the subject of international law to a great extent. Now look at this International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. It also allows the individuals to uh, have access to International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. After that, I will also come on to the jurisdiction and uh, Articles 21 and 22 of the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. That will tell you about the jurisdiction and you will find that the jurisdiction of uh, this tribunal comprises all disputes and all applications submitted to it in accordance with this convention and all matters which are specifically provided for in any other agreement which confers jurisdiction on the tribunal. So this convention, what are the matters which are covered in this convention? So all those matters are covered like EZ, Territorial Sea, uh, Continental Shelf, these matters are covered in this convention. And also some matters which are provided for in other agreement. Uh, but thereafter, that agreement confers jurisdiction on the tribunal. In that case, it loss will have again the jurisdiction. Article 22. 2.2, Law Center 2, Article 22, it further says that if all the parties to a treaty uh, uh, agree that some dispute concerning the interpretation or application of the treaty may be submitted to the tribunal, in that case also what will happen that the case may be referred to uh, this international tribunal for the law of the sea. So if you look at Articles 21 and 22, you'll find that the jurisdiction of it laws is not as narrow as the International Court of Justice. It is the, it is the new institution which was created 
in the late uh, in the in the later part or in the last decade of uh, the 20 uh, 20th century therefore it must have uh, something new and you see that these are the things which are new in this uh, uh, statute of international tribunal for the law of the sea now further moving on i will tell you that uh, international tribunal for the law of the sea uh, that uh, has chamber system you see that this is a chamber system which is uh, uh, chamber means uh, smaller uh, bodies so the, the tribunal has uh, small compositions of chambers and uh, the main chamber is called uh, seabed disputes chamber and uh, uh, this seabed disputes chamber is a very important chamber and uh, which is established according to article 14 of the statute of uh, it laws and uh, part 11 section 5 of un convention of the law of the sea and uh, this chamber is having the highest number of judges which is 11 judges uh, no el no other than this chamber has 11 judges of its own members of this chamber are selected by the members of the tribunal every three years apart from that uh, there is a special chamber, uh, the provision for establishment of special chamber, and uh, this, that those special chambers are different. Different, and uh, first of all, I will tell you about Article 15, which says that a special chamber of summary procedure can be also created, where upon the request of the parties, if the parties uh, think that their uh, dispute can be resolved quickly. Uh, then in that case, uh, if the whole tribunal is not in session, uh, then uh, if uh, the sufficient number of members of the tribunal uh, uh, is not available or the quorum is not available, in that case, the chamber of summary procedure can decide a dispute. It is composed of only five members. So this is a summary procedure chamber, very important. Uh, because uh, this it loss is not always functioning the whole tribunal is always not functioning but somebody procedure chamber that may function apart from the seabed disputes chamber and the special uh, chamber of summary procedure there are ad hoc chambers also so ad hoc as you know that what is the meaning of ad hoc ad hoc means uh, that the chamber which is established only to deal with certain thing yeah, so one specific purpose or some other purposes so uh, ad hoc chambers are composed of only three members of seabed dispute chamber but they are composed only after the approval of the parties to the dispute apart from uh, these different kinds of chambers there are also other special chambers uh, first is chamber for fisheries disputes in which if there is a specific dispute which is concerning the conservation and management of marine living resources which parties submit in that case what will happen that it may directly go to the fisheries disputes chamber and this disputes chamber is composed of nine members so this is also a very big uh, chamber composition of this chamber is also large the next special chamber is meant for the marine environment disputes so if there is a dispute uh, specifically related to marine environment because nowadays you may be knowing that marine environment has become very crucial so if any dispute is from, for from the marine environment then again it may be referred directly to that chamber and it has also nine members there is also a, a, a special chamber for maritime uh, delimitation disputes. So uh, it's, uh, it's also very important because maritime uh, or you, you see territorial delimitation disputes are very, very crucial. Likewise, maritime delimitation disputes are very crucial. I have therefore discussed with you the uh, maritime dispute cases which have gone to International Court of Justice like North Sea Continental Shelf and Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case and South China dispute 
and uh, different other disputes that I have referred, like Libya versus Malta, like Libya versus Tunisia. So, uh, therefore, these maritime delimitation disputes have been there, and therefore, there is a special chamber which is created for that uh, in its laws, and it has 11 members. Because you see that it is also very important, like it's like seabed dispute chamber. It's like maritime, uh, so it is same uh, like that. It's maritime delimitation chamber. <clears throat> Eleven members. Apart from that, there is also a possibility that the chamber may be special chamber may be created to deal with a particular dispute. One dispute, only one dispute, single dispute. Uh, parties have agreed that no a special chamber should be created for it. And uh, then, according to Article 15, sub, uh, 15 paragraph 2, uh, this composition of uh, such kind of special chamber may be uh, determined by the tribunal with approval of the parties. And therefore, uh, uh, you will see that uh, how uh, the parties have referred the dispute to this kind of chamber also. I will also now move on to uh, this uh, next uh, thing, which is uh, the orders and judgments of Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Uh, you will wonder that what is the value of the judgments and orders of this tribunal? As you know that uh, any tribunal which is created, uh, the award of the tribunal is always final. If somebody wants to appeal the award of the tribunal, uh, even in uh, the domestic uh, scenario, then it is very difficult and rarely it goes to high court and Supreme Court. Likewise, this is because this is speci specifically created for resolving the sea disputes and therefore because also of the, because of the fact that uh, the, ch the chambers are also there. And then there is a larger uh, tribunal also, the whole tribunal may sit and uh, uh, therefore you will find that the judgments and orders of this uh, uh, tribunal that is uh, very very uh, serious and final so i will tell you about some of the different types of judgments and orders like provisional orders uh, what is the uh, meaning of provisional orders sometimes what happens that uh, parties uh, like some ship is uh, uh, captured or uh, arrested, the crew members are arrested and ship is towed to uh, shore of a uh, state. Now in that case, the state which ship has been uh, uh, taken uh, by other state, that uh, state may go to it law saying that uh, please uh, order for a provisional measure so that our ship will be released. So such kind of provisional orders uh, may be coming from it laws and those orders are also binding. Apart from that, Article 28, which says that sometimes orders may be ex parte. Ex parte means that two parties are there in the dispute. Out of two parties, if only one party has gone to the tribunal, and despite reminders and uh, reminders, uh, the other party is not turning before uh, to, to the court. So in that case, what will happen that ex parte order can also come. Uh, because the party who has gone to the tribunal, uh, that party will request that, okay, because there is a, a ample time which has been lost and uh, you gave opportunity to the other party to come to you, but still uh, he has not or that party has not come. In that case, ex party orders can also be there. And those uh, orders are also binding. Apart from that, there are different other articles like Article 31 and 32, which allow third party interventions so uh, sometimes in a case uh, in which it has larger implications uh, the statute has allowed the third party interventions so like suppose if uh, if there is interpretation of uh, one uh, provision of the un convention the law of the sea and then other countries feel that no if uh, the interpretation will be given by the court it will be binding uh, for future therefore they will intervene so they will first of all request and the court will allow it or may not allow it also. Uh, lastly, Article 33, 33, easy, very easy to remember. Article 33 of this statute, it says that decisions of tribunal are final and binding upon the parties to the dispute. 
So this uh, removes all the doubts that it loss, what will happen to the it loss orders and judgments. It says article 33 says that the decisions of tribunal are uh, final and binding. Uh, so apart from that, uh, apart from that, what I will tell you that uh, the seabed disputes chamber is also there. And uh, this seabed disputes chamber uh, says that the order of the seabed disputes chamber, suppose if a seabed dispute has gone to uh, the seabed disputes chamber and uh, uh, then the order of seabed disputes chamber has come. And then you will wonder that, uh, okay, it lost judgments are fi final. Again, there is a specific article, article 3.9, which is there in the statute it says that the decisions of the chamber shall be enforceable in the territories of the state parties in the same manner as judgments or orders of the highest court of the state party in whose territory the enforcement is sought. What does it mean? It means that the seabed disputes chamber or decisions that would be enforced in the same manner as the highest court of the state party. For example, if India is a state party to UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and uh, what is the highest court of India? Supreme Court. So how do we enforce the judgment of the Supreme Court? Whole executive, uh, uh, they are duty bound to enforce the judgment of the Supreme Court. So likewise, the enforcement of the decisions of the Seabird Disputes Chamber, that will also be uh, like uh, that only. Uh, so what I was telling you that, uh, what I was telling you that the Seabird Disputes Chamber is also important uh, one and it's, uh, and it's, and it's uh, judgments are like the judgments of the Supreme Court. And likewise, what happens that you cannot ignore the order of the tribunal and Seabird Disputes Chamber. Uh, there is also a possibility that this tribunal can give advisory opinion on legal questions uh, which are submitted to it uh, by uh, those entities which are having the capacity to go to it and if any international agreement has given uh, this kind of uh, power to uh, it laws that they, it laws can give advisory opinion in that case uh, I, it laws can give advisory opinion also. However, advisory opinion is just advice. It is not binding. Finally, I will uh, take you to some of the important cases which are decided by uh, this tribunal. And the foremost case that I will tell you uh, is the Republic of Italy versus Union of India. And this uh, case was uh, only related to provisional measures. So I just told you about provisional measures, provisional orders. So this was the order, this was the provisional, uh, this was the request for uh, provisional measures. And uh, it was decided in 2015, just five years back, when the Italian Marines, they were uh, in India. And uh, for a long time, uh, I have already discussed with you uh, this uh, case, Republic of Italy versus Union of India, which was pending before the Supreme Court. And uh, now, in the context of it loss, what I'm uh, telling you that this provisional measures case uh, was the case because uh, one of the Italian Marines, uh, he went back to Italy because uh, he was suffering uh, problems uh, in his heart and he also suffered a stroke. And thereafter, he was uh, moved uh, to Italy. Uh, but one of the Marines was still there in India. And therefore, what happened that uh, uh, and uh, therefore Italy uh, went to uh, it laws asking, requesting it laws to issue a provisional order by which the other Medin will also be lifted to Italy. Uh, and uh, thereafter what may happen that it was also requesting that uh, to order India that the case which is pending before the Supreme Court that should be listed out and uh, that Supreme Court has no jurisdiction over uh, these people. However, India was contending that uh, Supreme Court has the jurisdiction because it is the highest court of the country and the crime took place uh, uh, within the uh, maritime zone of India. And therefore, we had the power to 
uh, uh, try these two Italian Marines. Uh, because the court had not to go into merits of the case, it was only for the provisional measures. Therefore, PCA left it to the Supreme Court of India to fix the precise condition of bail of another Marine. And thereafter, uh, it also held that uh, uh, the, these, the, the Italian Marine, which will, uh, uh, who will go back to Italy, will be asked to report to Indian authorities. And uh, lastly, Italy was asked to apprise the Supreme Court of India every three months about uh, the condition of uh, those two Marines. So uh, this was a very important uh, order and uh, it law's order was uh, binding and India accepted the order and uh, it, it sent uh, the other Marine back to Italy. Next case uh, that I will uh, discuss uh, will be uh, the dispute, maritime boundary dispute uh, between Bangladesh and Myanmar. And in this dispute, what happened that uh, there, was, there was no such uh, there was no such dispute which has gone to it, uh, it loss uh, on maritime boundary. So uh, this was the dispute, uh, Bangladesh versus Myanmar. And uh, you'll find that this, this dispute was uh, heard by this tribunal and this tribunal uh, was having also a judge uh, from India. And uh, you see that uh, this Chandrasekhar Rao, Chandrasekhar Rao was uh, PC Rao of India was there as a judge. And uh, uh, all the judges, 21 judges of uh, it lost, they had given this uh, judgment. And uh, this was a judgment in which uh, the territorial sea, continental shelf and exclusive economic zone, all these three different maritime zones, those were delimited. And not only up to EZ, uh, which is there up to 200 nautical miles, but beyond 200 nautical miles also, the court had to decide because both parties wanted a firm decision from it loss about the maritime dispute. And uh, in this case, what happened that Bangladesh was trying to convince the it loss that uh, its territorial sea should be delimited on the basis of uh, application of uh, relevant circumstances or special circumstances rule because its uh, coastline is concave and uh, uh, then it has uh, uh, the different river basins and those river basins always change their course and therefore uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is not uh, good that uh, equidistance formula, mechanical formula should be implemented but then uh, this equidistance formula should be adjusted because of these different circumstances of Bangladesh. On the other hand, uh, Myanmar was uh, requesting the it loss that no, it is not the fact uh, 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 that Bangladesh is not having a stable coastline. It is having a very firm, good, uh, firm, stable coastline. And therefore, it should not be that equidistance formula should be not applied. However, uh, it loss applied equidistance formula in case of territorial waters delimitation only. Because it said that uh, for the purpose of delimitation, uh, territorial waters is just 12 nautical miles and within 12 nautical miles, there is no such uh, uh, effect upon uh, the whole median line that we are drawing because it is a very small area. However, Bangladesh contention that was accepted by it laws as far as that part of maritime area which is beyond territorial waters. So up to exclusive economic zone and for continental shelf area, Bangladesh contention that no, the median line should be adjusted because uh, their coastline and uh, their, uh, uh, the shape of the coastline, those are different and therefore, and the fishing community, all these things. So ultimately, uh, uh, what happened that the tribunal held that uh, equidistance formula can be applied up to territorial waters, uh, but the equidistance formula will not be strictly applied uh, for the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. So it adjusted, it, it, it made a provisional 
median line and they are after it adjusted according to uh, the wishes of both the parties bangladesh mainly uh, so it uh, was affected by the contention of bangladesh uh, finally uh, i will also tell you a little bit about uh, uh, the recent dispute which has been submitted to it laws which is between mauritius and maldives and this dispute is also concerning the delimitation of maritime boundary uh, so this will be the second maritime boundary case before it laws and uh, in this uh, case a special chamber has been constituted i have just told you that there is a provision in the in the statute that a special chamber for a specific dispute may be constituted if the parties they agree and then uh, pray to the uh, the tribunal and if the tribunal accepts it so in this case also what happened that both these parties mauritius and maldives they agreed that there should be a constitution of a special chamber to deal with this maritime delimitation dispute and so in this case what happened that a special chamber has been constituted and this case is just uh, this case is going to start and in this case uh, the tribunal which is composed in that tribunal there is the, the judge from india neeru chadda uh, is there so maybe that it will again take time three four years it will take because it is very difficult to uh, decide a dispute which is on maritime delimitation but the whole thing that i was trying to tell you that uh, this tribunal is a very important uh, uh, body which is a new body which is established on the international plane and this body you must know because in your examination maybe that uh, uh, maybe that it, uh, one a small question may be asked that what is uh, what is the uh, jurisdiction and what are the functions uh, of uh, international tribunal for the law of the sea uh, 